at Stubbs, as in many other camps, internees established what John Davidson Ketchum, a civilian internee in Berlin, called prison camp societies. These societies included a largely self-administered infrastructure of schools, libraries, vegetable gardens, musical, theatre and sports societies, and more. At Stubbs, the internees also produced a camp newspaper called Stubbsyard. It was started by the civilian internees and then continued by the military prisoners of war later on. This is what the original edition of the paper looked like. This was the military edition. A transcript of the paper is available on this website, allowing you to view the German version alongside the English translation. Both the civilian and the military edition is available through this site and Throughout my presentation, I will be um, showing you passages from the paper uh, based on this website. I'm starting this presentation with Stobsyard because much of what we know about the creative life in the camp is based on reports in the camp newspaper. Stobsyard highlighted the positive impact of the physical and intellectual pursuits that the interne internees engaged in. The following passage gives a good glimpse of the mix of people in the camp and their rationale for keeping themselves occupied. I've highlighted the relevant bit in purple and you can see the original text in German on the left. So this is what Stobsjad writes. Several thousand people with a very varied range of occupations and inclinations live in Stubbs, surrounded by a barbed wire fence. People with similar interests get together and want to encourage one another and help their comrades to prevent themselves and others from weakening mentally and physically. Anyone who's passed the long winter evenings here or has looked through the wire fence into the blue yonder in summer knows the importance of a short lecture, a concert, a theatrical performance or competition in keeping himself spiritually and physically fit so that someday, without too much damage, he will be able to engage once again in the work of our people. This is from number 20 of the military edition of Stubbsyard. Lectures, concerts, theatrical performances and competitions are mentioned in this passage as popular activities among the internees. Theatre clubs or societies were one of the focal points of creative life in Stubbs camp. Of course, limitations of space and material posed obstacles, but the internees overcame them with real ingenuity. Because there were no women in the camp, men had to take on female parts through cross-dressing, and I will discuss this in a bit more detail later on. An article in Stobbsyard on drama society is written on the occasion of some members' departure to work camps, underlines the amount of work that went into preparing performances, the inventive use of materials and props, and the performer's admirable commitment. Stobbsyard writes, the history of the Stubbs theatre clubs is one of a constant battle with all kinds of difficulties, limited means, difficulties in obtaining the stage and costume material and so on. Only the selfless pleasure of working and the awareness of working for the common good help to overcome these difficulties. More than enough work was needed for every performance. Just think about it. All the often quite splendid settings by stop standards were cobbled together from wood, tin cans, canvas and distemper. The costumes, especially for the female roles, were cut to shape using English material to match the fashion of the period in which the action took place. The actors often had to practice their roles, which were often extensive and challenging to act, in reading and life rehearsals for hours and hours over a period of days or even weeks. 
One thing you have to give the theatre friends credit for, they were excellently directed. The goal was the, which the club set for itself was to bring life itself onto the stage. The pieces they performed always offered something humane in which each of us found something he could relate to. This was printed in number 10 of the military edition of Stobbs Yard. So this comment shows that theatre in the camps played an important role for the internees and that the plays were meant to encourage some philosophical reflection on the prisoners' identities alongside, of course, uh, light-hearted entertainment to, to, to bring some distraction to life in the camp. As the largest camp in Scotland, Stops was actually pretty well equipped. The situation in some of the smaller work camps required even more innovative solutions. Number 16 of Stops Yard in December 1917 comments on the challenges faced by the theatre society in one of the work camps in the Highlands. But it's also very clear from this report that the men found ways of putting each other's skills to good use. The stage and props were made by a joiner and painter, and the camp tailor was responsible for the costumes. Wigs apparently were made from pine and larch trees, which must have uh, caused quite a bit of amusement among the audience members. At another camp, the stage was constructed of tabletops resting on benches. The curtain and stage design were made of blankets. Paraffin lamps were used for lighting. It appears that the camp leadership generally didn't really intervene in the internee's creative performances at Stops or elsewhere. Wilhelm Pult, a former German lieutenant, writing about Lee Camp in Greater Manchester in his memoirs, remarked that, um, and I quote, the British did not interfere with the German stage life and let us do as we pleased. Like at Stops, the performers at Lee initially had to make do with the most primitive props and costumes, designing female costumes from towels and constructing stage scenery out of woolen blankets. At Stops, there were several drama societies, including Dramatischer Verein and Theaterverein. Members of these societies experienced a number of challenges due to changeover. Um, quite a few prisoners were moved to work camps or some of them were also exchanged, so they left the country entirely. And sometimes the internees also struggled to find suitable texts for performances. Nevertheless, they achieved remarkable results and Stobbs Yard rather proudly commented, quote, we have playwrights on our schedule that even professional theatres wouldn't dare to stage. In June 1918, the paper praised colleagues for their professional leadership. Some internees actually had a theatre or arts background. There was one man with a background in directing. I've highlighted the passage here about Mr. B. Wagner Bogenhardt of the Dortmund Town Theatre, who understood excellently how to awaken the talent of the actors and to steer them in the right direction. This made it possible for the club to dare to perform Ibsen's Ghosts to celebrate its second anniversary. It was a big venture to give the public an understanding of the great Nordic naturalist. The director, the actors and the technical staff gave their best and achieved the most enduring success. This was number 21 of Stubbs Yard. The drama societies attempted to offer a varied program, a mix of intellectually challenging plays and more light-hearted entertainment. Contemporary naturalist drama such as Ibsen was of course part of the more challenging fair, but there are also plenty of examples of more light-hearted comedies. German drama was very popular of course, but there is also evidence of engagement with other national traditions, including the Norwegian Ibsen, as we've already heard, or the English writer Jerome K. Jerome, um, whose comedy Miss Hobbs was, was also staged. 
here are a couple of examples of program leaflets. The, the, the text on the left um, was a handwritten program marking the opening of the theater in the military camp in February 1916. As was quite typical, the event was a mixture of music and theater. There was a break in between and at the bottom we see that the evening began at 6 p.m. and there was an appeal to the audience to refrain from smoking. Es wird gebeten, nicht zu rauchen. These documents were previously owned by soldier Rabenschlag, who, as you can see on the left, was actually one of the performers and his name appears across a number of um, programs. On the right here, we see the program of a revue, Große Weihnachtsrevue, a variety evening taking place over Christmas 1915. It had been organized by the civilian camp committee. Again, the event consisted of a mixture of entertainment forms, which here included singing and dancing alongside some dramatic performances as well. And the leaflet also alludes to the camp authority's support for such events and performances. Um, it says um, at the bottom or towards the middle here, veranstaltet mit gütiger Erlaubnis des Kommandanten um, Baumann, with kind permission from camp commander Lieutenant Colonel Baumann. With its rich theatrical theatrical life, Stobbs acquired a reputation elsewhere. Other internment camps in Scotland and England apparently re requested costumes, decorations and literature, but um, the Stobbs-based societies were not always able to fulfil these requests because they too found it quite difficult to acquire the material in the first place. Performances proved very popular at Stobbs, for the winter of 1917-1918, for example, Stubbs Yard recorded an impressive 12,817 theatre visitors. Cross-dressing was one striking feature of theatre in internment camps. Some men adopted female parts in the theatre productions uh, staged within the camps, and this was a common practice during the First World War, at Stubbs, cross-dressing too occurred very regularly and based on historical documents such as reviews in the paper or programs and leaflets, it seems that some of the men actually specialised in female roles. In his study of barbed wire disease, a psychological condition brought on by long-term internment, the Swiss medical doctor Adolf Vischer also commented on the role of theatre in internment camps and he also commented on the function of female impersonators. Writing in 1919, Vischer noted that the female impersonators held on to their character names even after the performances and, I quote, each had her young man or lover. The camp inhabitants also organized dances attended by half the men in ladies' clothing. A poem in the civilian edition of Stubbs Yard in October 1915 rather cheekily commented on such a ball taking place in the canteen in, in one of the huts. The last two stanzas of this poem read as follows. And I'm actually going to read out the German also because the original rhymes very nicely, which doesn't come across in the English translation, but I've highlighted the relevant uh, section in the English version here. Weiberhüte weiße Blusen, seidene Strümpfe, offene Busen, Bursche in Verkleidung, in der Röcke offenen Schlitzen sieht man Spitzenhöschen blitzen. Leider Bursche nur, oho, jauchzt das Piccolo. Women's hats and white blouses, silk stocking and exposed bosoms, lads and drag through the open slits in their skirts. You can catch a flash of lace, lace panties. Sadly, they are lads, but oho. 
the piccolo whoops. Wilder wird die Tanzerregung, in dem Rhythmus der Bewegung schwankt die ganze Hütte. Alles Leid, das uns durchrüttelt, ist im Tanze abgeschüttelt. Und dazwischen, schrill und froh, jauchzt das Piccolo. The excitement of the dance becomes wilder with the rhythm of the movement. The whole hut sways. All the sorrow that churns through us is shaken off by the dance. And between it, shrill and happy, the Piccolo whoops. So this poem strikingly conveys the merry celebrations taking place in the internees huts and gives us a glimpse of the temporary, temporary release from suffering that the raucous entertainment would have brought to the internees. A review in the military edition of Stobziat of a review evening on Easter Monday 1917 similarly mentions the performance of a dance of a gavotte in Biedermeier costume featuring, quote, three ladies and three gentlemen. The writer of this piece declared this event, this dance performance, a pretty novelty in Stubbs. And it's really only in the passing reference elsewhere in the paper that there are hints that some prisoners of war were discomforted by what the paper describes as ladies with deep voices. The cross-dressing at balls and performances has some interesting implications for how we might think about the internees' gender and sexual identities. Vischer, in his study, remarked in 1919 that it wasn't uncommon for two male friends at the camps to start to associate like lovers. And similarly, the German sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld suggested in his monumental study, The Sexual History of the World War, which was originally published in German in 1930, that um, antipathy to homoerotic love this is a quote, among prisoners decreased partly due to such impersonations in internment camps, so, so that these impersonations um, actually had a, had a beneficial um, function to play in terms of a wider social tolerance. The fact that men performed in drag or attended such events of course doesn't mean that all of them actively participated in a homoerotic subculture. But what it does suggest is that for some of these men, such cross-dressing might have allowed them to express something about their own identity that was about more than simply light-hearted entertainment. Let's have a look at some of the other performances taking place at Stubbs. Most issues of Stop's Yard contain reviews of theatre, music and other events and performances, again indicating that this was a regular feature of life in the camp. If you would like to find out more details about what they were performing, I recommend you visit the Stop's Yard website and have a browse through the paper to, to really get a sense of the kinds of plays that, that they put on, that they, that they chose. Number six of Stubbs Yard in February 1917 comments on the celebrations of um, on the 27th of January, an event that had taken place to celebrate the Emperor's birthday. And this event had included music and dramatic performances. And this is the program leaflet that you can see here, a so-called Lustspielabend or comedy evening a mixture of two German plays and, and some light music to frame these plays. Similar to drama, music played an important role in the camps. There was a lively music scene with a camp orchestra and choirs. Music was sent in by donors and Stubbs Yard was used to request more donations from people back home. The men occasionally complained about their limited options and the lack of variety in music. So Stopsia became one vehicle to, to, to 
um, publicize their requests and their wishes. Stobziad offers a good overview of the different concerts that were given and the kind of pieces that were donated and performed. Some of the men in the camp were actually professional musicians. For example, there is um, a professional singer, uh, Herr Bachenheimer, whose name is mentioned again and again and whose presence was obviously very much appreciated. A reviewer of the um, Lustspielabend in Stubziad wrote that for many of us these celebrations will form one of those rare memories of life and confinement when we were able to forget about all the ugliness and narrow-mindedness of our environment. So clearly music and theatre was very important. The significance of music for the men's lives in captivity is also conveyed by the fact that even though musical instruments were being packed up and shipped back home at the end of the war, internees tried to keep enough musical instruments to continue some performances during the last few months of their internment while waiting for release. In 2018, I was part of a team from Edinburgh Napier University that put on a series of performances based on the Lustspielabend, the comedy evening that was staged at Stubbs in January, in January 1917. We used the programme found at Hoyt Museum as a starting point. Our director, Ian Davey, was keen to convey what life was like as an internee by creating an entertaining framework rather than giving lectures about Stubbs camp and World War I history. We employed writer Charity Trim, who developed a backstage play, which we called A Night at Stubbs, uh, featuring six characters who discuss information we had found in letters and other historical sources. Through a combination of humour and pathos, the conversation conveys some of the challenges encountered by the prisoners of war, from having to do with limited props and costumes to touching personal stories about the long wait between letters from home. The dramatic dialogue in this frame narrative tied the two plays and the music together and demonstrated how important evenings of entertainment were to the internees. Here's a short clip from this performance featuring students and graduates from Edinburgh Napier's music and acting degrees. The full performance can be viewed online by following the link on the Stops Camp website and I've also given you the link to the full video recording at the end of the slideshow. <laughs> Really? Very itchy. It looks like a cow pot. Oh, Front, no. it does not look like a bow. It's the best we could do with a ball of yarn. Yeah, they've got proper horsehair wigs at the camp at Nokolo. How do you know? My brother Oscar's intern there. He was in a show last month. He played uh, a policeman, a butcher, and an angry sheep. Different wigs for each role, all specially crafted and fitted by a professional wig maker. Is he a fellow in, mate? Well, probably. Well, that's something to bear in mind for our second show, perhaps, but tonight you just have to make do. And your bosoms look woeful. Again! Very rude. No, nah, they're all saggy. They look like scrunched up socks. They are scrunched up socks! He's got a proper costume department in Frimley. He has another brother. Yeah. Ermin. He says their bosoms look really realistic. But they had actual costume fittings. We had fittings, from That wasn't a fitting, Billy. You use clothes pegs to hold in the waist of my dress and spittle to stiffen my cuffs. Look, this is our first show. With the ticket money we make this evening, we can purchase costumes and wigs and makeup. They've got proper blush and powder a hand for. Not another brother. Uh, yes, Otto. His mother's very proud. Four sons all captured within the first six weeks of action. <laughs> what a legacy. Yeah, well, she enjoys the letters that we send back and the newspapers too. And. I'll leave the quizzes for her to do. So. They're letting the audience in. Oh, God. 
I mean, good, good, great. Right, uh, we'll be fine, won't we, Rob? Uh, Hans, I mean, we've rehearsed. We know our lines. They're all smiling. They look really excited and wet. It must be raining. Uh, not again. It's not stopped raining since we've arrived. It's nothing personal, Rolf. That's just stops. It rains. Driving horizontal rain. Or heavy straight down so few in seconds rain. Or misty pathetic rain that plays havoc with your hair. That's why there's so much mud everywhere. It's a nightmare for us gardeners. All the lettuces are waterlogged. A fairly detailed review of the original comedy evening was printed in Stubbs Yard. Drama Club, January 1917. Heinrich von Kleist's classic comedy, The Broken Jug, found a success on our stage, which it never fails to do. The delightful coarse humour, which runs through the whole play, did not invoke great laughter, but the kind of consistent internal amusement that only a masterpiece can induce. Everything develops in a natural and, after all, logical way from the reliably drawn characters in the initial freshness and originality, together with the harmony of the whole, all conveying a consistent impression. If the broken jug must be considered on its own terms, certain contemporary questions played into the comedy By Ourselves by Ludwig Fulda. The idea? Quiet domestic happiness is more satisfying than the noisy interaction with the so-called big world. This idea is successfully conveyed in a narrow framework so that it gave us a good opportunity to imagine behind the barbed wire the kind of happiness that we are all longing for so intensely. This review sums up, in a nutshell, how the internees use their creative endeavours to entertain themselves and their peers, but also importantly, how drama performances allow them to momentarily escape their conditions by conjuring a world beyond the barbed wire. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this short insight into Stobbs Camp's creative life.